everything? Yep, awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for the intro, Scott. And also, just a big thank you to yourself, um, Sebastian, and of course, Bron, for organising this. This is the start of the third year now. Not many meetups survive this long with this good attendance and this sort of uh, fancy high-class venue, so congratulations. Um, so I'm talking today about defending your layer one infrastructure with Amazon Web Services. Now, um, briefly about me, I used to uh, do stuff with a certain large uh, New Zealand website, um, a whole bunch of infrastructure bits. I now do a whole bunch of infrastructure stuff for large volumes of push messaging and analytics for a, uh, for a small company in Wellington slash large US company. And I enjoy doing DevOps, Linux, Amazon, and making MongoDB web scale. And these are all very enjoyable things, but in between times when I'm not making Mongo web scale, I also enjoy to indulge in a delicious beverage of some kind. And there's nothing better that complements a delicious beverage than reading the blog of our prophet and master about what latest revolutionary technologies have been brought down to this mortal coil. And I was enjoying this one day, sitting there going, well actually, maybe there's a problem here because there are people who seek to destroy this beautiful way of life. And I don't mean cyber terrorists. I mean, those guys are sorted. We've got firewalls and semantic. I'm sure, I'm sure it works. But I do mean these sort of fellows, the people who like to break into your house and steal your delicious beer and your awesome iPad. And so, like most people, I thought about a problem. I was like, well, we better, we better do some stuff about this. And of course, duh, just by an alarm, these things have existed for, you know, 20 odd years. But house alarms are kind of useless because it's like a Nargios alert that says, something is broken. And if you're really lucky, it says, something is broken in room one. This isn't helpful. I don't know whether that's my cat climbing a curtain or, you know, a guy climbing through a window of a crowbar. This technology is very, very silly. So what I really needed was human to IP. And it turns out there was a thing for this called a video camera. And I brought a whole bunch of these enterprise video cameras that basically record and pump traffic over a network back to a server running a Java agent. And what this software essentially does is give me motion detected recordings of things that have happened on those cameras. Um, dumps out a bunch of MP4 files and has some nice app interface. So, and that's what it kind of looked like. So you can see they fit the classical decal of a uh, villa very, very nicely with their plastic and their green ethernet cables. Um, the only problem, really other problem with that other than offending the um, real estate style is the motion detection isn't very good because the motion detection on almost all of these products is based on pixel volume changes. So X number of pixels move between the two frames, therefore there must be someone there. Of course that in Wellington means every time the wind blows, so every day, um, and including things like brightness changes as clouds move in front of the sun. Um, so you can see on the side there, there's an example of my camera feed that pretty much tells me that my house is under a constant barrage of attackers. Um, not, very, not very helpful. And of course, thinking about this, I realized surely you can use computers to solve this. I mean, image recognition is not a new problem. I mean, there's various commercial products and of course things like OpenCV. But the problem with these tools is they are very much built around you knowing A, computer science, and B, being able to train all the models properly. Um, and it's still very difficult to get good accuracy on that. Um, I don't know computer science and I'm extremely lazy when it comes to my personal stuff, so I wanted an easier solution. And of course our lords and masters at Amazon came to the party with a brilliant new product late last year called Amazon Recognition. And the most important thing to know about this product is, yes it is spelled for K, there's no idea how much annoyed this annoyed me when trying to write code, I have to keep misspelling it all the time. Um, yeah, very, very frustrating. But the cool thing about it is it detects objects and imagery and it provides labels against them. So elephant on the screen, Recognizes as an animal, as an elephant, as a mammal. Awesome. Um, that's a dog, so it recognizes again as an animal. It recognizes types of breeds, I don't know how accurate it is, it recognizes a Labrador hound beagle. Um, but you know, it's kind of a core cool concept. But these are quite basic because we're only looking at a single object on a white screen that's very, very simplified and also very clear shots. So, what about more complex scenes? So that's a picture of a cat drinking from a water bowl in my house. And it's actually detected that there is a cat, 82% probability. It's also detected there's a bowl at 53% probability. Where you can see it falls down is it can't recognize that that leg belongs to a chair, or that's the bottom of a curtain, uh, or that's a horrible cork floor, but it, it's kind of, it's able to pick up clear whole objects quite nicely. And it doesn't always work. So this is a cat side on, and although you've got distinctive four feet, because there's no leg or head shot, it doesn't actually recognize it as a cat. Um, but it does solve a very interesting uh, philosophical debate, which is it does confirm that if you eat ice cream from a carton, it in fact counts as eating from a bowl. 
Um, there's a 53% chance that's correct. All right, weirder stuff. So this is a cat that's upside down, so you don't have a clear shot of a cat. It makes it a lot harder to detect. And you'll see here it's actually picked up that there is a person in there, 98% probability. Uh, but it's also detected that there is, in fact, a cat there, 70% probability. That's quite a, good, quite a good rating, despite only having a partial view of the face and three paws rather than the usual four. Um, it has also confirmed that actually one cat equals two babies, um, with 52% cat to baby ratio. Uh, it actually probably answers a few things for people about, about uh, the role of pets in their lives. Um, but it's also gone and said, hey, it's probably a rodent too. So it's, you know, it's not perfect. Um, so this is more serious stuff. So this is a footage of my front window. Just one question. Sure. Is more sure that it saw a cat than it saw a mammoth? Uh, so it reckons it's 70% cat. 56% um, mammal. Yeah, 56% mammal. <laughs> mammal. I don't quite know how this works sometimes. And like things like pet. Like, is there a separate set of rules that detects a pet? Or is it just going glossary term, cat is therefore pet? I'm not really sure how that works. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, so more realistic real, real situation, that's me strong down my path towards my house. And the first thing to note is it hasn't detected that I'm there. So obviously that's a problem for me. But it's gone and detected like a million different items it sees in the footage, like different types of vegetation. Uh, but at one point before I cut the grass, it said there was a jungle. Um, <laughs> it's actually, actually quite clever what it, what it gets up to. Um, now, what happens when I get closer is it actually does recognise there's a human there. So it's now 98%, 99% certain that there is in fact a human walking down that path. And that's something I can work with because, you know, although you might look at the house from a distance, at some point if you actually want to uh, infiltrate your layer one defences, you have to get close to the house. Um, so a good chance to get that footage. And the other thing I've noticed with Amazon recognition is that you do tend to get a very clear cut human or no human. I've never had like 50% human, I've always had 90 plus percent human or nothing at all. Um, so I was like, well, this is cool. You know, we can pick up multiple items in a scene. It's really good when we've got clear footage. But even with my you know, bad angle camera footage, weather conditions, it's feasible enough to use to process camera footage. So in theory, use my camera, detect all these recordings, pass them for recognition, shove the output in S3, and page of the house operations team that there is a uh, issue going on. <laughs> so did a really first rough prototype, and this is horrendous. So basically, I used the existing software on a Mac Mini in the house that's running this uh, video recorder. And every time I dropped a file on disk, I would suck that file up with iNotify, dump it to an S3 bucket, and then do a triggered lambda that would process that file, look for interesting frames, and then shove the output somewhere. Um, but this wasn't, uh, wasn't particularly good because it was really, really dodgily put together. And the video files that would drop on disk were segments. So it would basically give me, for a 10 second video, I'll get two second segments. But I wouldn't know which one's finished to one event and which one's associated to another event. And I missed any metadata in that way because I wasn't integrating with the software. Um, so, you know, I thought, oh, I'd better build something a little bit nicer, but I actually had a bit of a cursor choice here because I needed somewhere to run a bunch of compute, and I thought, well, what do I use? Because Amazon's got so many things now. I can run on EC2, like a traditional application, like a VM. I could do it in containers of ECS. I could do it on Beanstalk, where it's like a managed layer on top of EC2. Or I could do this weird Lambda thing. And of course, the answer is Lambda, because why else would you use anything else? Um, and if you're not really familiar with Lambda, you really have to talk to Scott here, but... um. Essentially, you're provisioning compute, or well, paying for compute on a 100 millisecond basis only when you need it to run just the workload that you want. And that means, of course, because there's no servers, it's the best thing ever. And of course, I was like, right, I'll rub some DevOps on it and apply some Lambda. And what I ended up with is a little Java agent running alongside the recording software on the server that would talk to the WebScale database and the less WebScale Java app, download video recordings, and then post them up into API Gateway into Lambda, extract out the frames, and party on. Only problem is it doesn't actually work, because Lambda has a 6 megabyte fixed object request size limit, and API Gateway has a fixed request size limit of 10 megabytes. And I mean, if you think about the use case, it's primarily, you know, like it says, APIs. It doesn't normally run into an issue, but for me pushing, you know, 2 meg, 10 meg, 15, 50 meg image, uh, video files, it becomes a real issue. So I was like, well, I can fix this. I can re-architect it around S3 and say, hey, post me my video event metadata to a Lambda, get a pre-signed URL from S3, tell the server agent to, log, to upload into the S3 bucket and do a little bit of a dance to process it. Um, and, you know, it would legitimately work fine. But I didn't really want to do that because I wanted the connector to be as dumb as possible. So I wanted to change up my connector in the future to maybe be essentially a curl, a curl job running on the camera so you didn't need a server. 
I want to have that flexibility. Uh, I've been having to include the ABS SDK with a little bit of a little bit of weight to that. So even if I ignored that and said, fuck it, I'll ship a library, I've still got some other problems. Recognition's really fast, but when you're giving it, you know, 50 frames of video, it takes a little while to, you know, process that and detect cats. Um, and I'm also doing some crazy stuff with Java, like 200 meg jar files where I'm dumping in lots of native bindings for FFmpeg and OpenCV and some other nastiness. Um, and I also ran some real headaches with serverless framework around the documentation and examples of Java Lambdas. Um, I wasn't too happy with that. The Python stuff, the Node stuff's all right, but the Java stuff I found quite difficult, particularly not being a Java dev, um, which makes you wonder why I chose Java, but, you know, another time. <laughs> So I think about this and I was like, maybe I'm trying to do it wrong. I'm trying to force the wrong solution into this to solve, to solve this problem. Could make it work, but maybe it's a bad idea. So what I really came to, what, what sort of conclusion I came to was that Lambda is very much like the early stages of infrastructure as a service in Amazon. So remember back a number, quite a few years ago now, when you first started moving stuff to Amazon, you didn't have persistent disk. You didn't have network attack storage. You had an object store and ephemeral compute. You had to re-architect your applications to run and get the true benefit of being on that platform. And over time, they padded out with other feature sets to fill in the gap so that you could go, this app requires NFS, well, here you go. This app requires attached storage, here you go. I still feel like Lambda is a little bit like that. If you architect properly for Lambda from day one, it's awesome. But if you do what I did, which is write a terrible Java app and then try and fit it into Lambda, you're going to suffer. Um, so it's sort of like, a, I guess, an educational process for myself. Um, so I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing with Java and Lambda, so let's go back to traditional architecture, running some compute on EC2. Um, but it's not all lost. I can still adopt the awesome glory of Lambda because I'm using my traditional core architecture of running on compute, but then feeding the events into S3, and I could do Lambda doing, or have Lambdas do all my event-based outputs from the S3 bucket. So I drop in a video with metadata associated with it and have Lambda generate a push message to my phone. Um, in fact, I could take it a bit further and have things like DynamoDB and store all the events in DynamoBB, trigger lambdas from that to do, do push messaging and S3 downloads for the applications. So there's some really cool use cases there, and it's not necessarily I have to go full in with Lambda if it doesn't reflect my use case, I can actually mix and match the best technology for the job. Um, so at Lambda's still awesome, still love it, I just couldn't refit really it for this particular use case. Um, and ECS is kind of a nice in between if you've got a workload that's just a little bit too well, poorly coded, like mine, uh, for Lambda, but you don't run one traditional EC2 compute, you can chuck it in a Docker, Docker container and run it on ECS to get the auto scanning speed and to get the cost savings that you really want. So, cool story, bro. Does this actually work? Well, can recognition actually be work used for your home securely? And you can. So, on one side, you've got the full list of the usual day to day alerts, and the other side is after I ran it through the processing. And you can see there, there's me leaving the house and then there's me coming back. And all the day-to-day -day noise has been excluded, which is quite handy when you actually want to go back in time and see what's been happening around my house. So that's just a labeling feature. So I thought about more, what about facial recognition? Can I detect who is encroaching my house and looking around the place? But the problem I had is the footage angles on these security cameras isn't really good enough for a clear facial shot many times. It's probably enough to do a police lineup, but not enough to go I can analyze their face in details. Um, maybe when we get 4K, 8K cameras, then it'll be a different story. Um, to give you an example though, it is quite clever. If you do get a good shot, it will recognize generally your gender, your age, range, oh, age range is pretty terrible, I'm not quite that haggard. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks Will. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 reasonably, it's reasonably cool, and that age range is a brand new feature that I added the other day. Um, but it's also a bit of weirdness here because it's also circled my cat. Um, <laughs> but also interestingly, that's not my cat's face, it's recognised that the ear of my cat is actually a face. Um, so my cat's ear is a 20 to 38 year old uh, male, um, and it's 50% happy. So there's, a, there's a, obviously a couple of little uh, quirks there to still be worked out. Probably, I'm guessing it matches like a smile in some way, and it thinks it's a, thinks it's a face from there. Um, and like I suspected, it doesn't really work for strolling down the path. You just don't have enough clear footage of a face in a, in a still enough frame. Um, yet, you know, a couple of generations of tech, it'll probably be a solved problem. Um, also, interestingly, it won't handle adult material or hate material. Um, and before you go, oh yeah, Jeffrey, you just want to feed in your old being a monkey porn collection and analyze it and sort it. 
aside from that, it's actually got legitimate annoyances in the real world because if you're working on things like social media or forums or that sort of stuff, you can't analyse things like avatar images to look for un inappropriate content. The system just ignores it and just doesn't tell you anything about it. So even if it just said, you know, nudity true, that would be really valuable, but it doesn't do that yet, uh, which is a little bit annoying. Um, so surely this costs a fortune. I mean, I'm pouring tons of video frames into this compute service. It's, I think, re very reasonably priced. It's a dollar US per 1,000 images. Um, of course, with the volumes I'm doing, that will add up quite quickly. So I'm using a few tricks. I'm grabbing one frame a second because you're not going to run past my house in like 10 milliseconds. Um, we don't keep processing a video after we first detect a human. If it's two minutes of a human setting a TV, I only need the first match. And I linked it to my alarm system, so when I arm the alarm, it arms the AI and starts processing, and when I disarm it, it doesn't bother, it just files it to storage. So that's my personal bill, it's a uh, mind-blowing $31. Uh, you can see my half-month spend is $2.45 for recognition, which is pretty awesome when you think about how I'm abusing it. Now, I don't think they ever intended for someone to pour a video for it. Um, and it's actually really cheap when you think about like commercial AI solutions for this sort of stuff. I mean, Alphabet slash Google slash whatever they're called tomorrow um, has a service called Nest, and they can process your video footage for about 100 US a month, uh, which is a big difference to $2.45. Um, naturally, their app is probably much more sophisticated than mine. Um, I've got an exciting iOS app that at the moment just loads an image, and that's it. Uh, very high quality. So if you too enjoy running really bad Java software to trust your home security, you're welcome to check it out and download some links, and I'll post these out afterwards. Um, if you also find Lambda and AI recognition stuff really interesting, um, a friend of mine did a really cool post where he's using Amazon Lambda and OpenCV within the Lambda itself to analyze his, neighbor, his flatmate's cat attacking the mice in the cage uh, and detecting when those events occur. Um, it's quite a cool post, you should definitely, definitely check it out. So that's me. I um, hope this looks, you know, got you interested about recognition and some of the other AI stuff that Amazon's starting to do. There's some really interesting features coming out, particularly in like the text and speech space from Amazon as well. I've only just touched the surface for my particular use case. Uh, but I'll send up the links after this and maybe take questions offline just due to time constraints. Thank you very much.